Yeah, sure. If I start getting close to that, just give me a cutoff and I can. All right. 
So thank you for the introduction, Pat, and thank you for the opportunity to the uh, event coordinators for um, allowing us to share our research. Um, as you guys probably know, Cat Lab um, been around since 2002 and pretty heavy presence in the highway and roadway mode. Um, but we're, we're more recently getting involved with other modes and I was a PI on a project for the FRA that um, is still ongoing. We're in the second phase of it now. Uh, so it's been about three years and the, the project is called the Railroad Information Sharing Environment. So I'm kind of just going to walk you through some background on the project itself and then the end product of phase one uh, of, of this uh, RISE project was a Tableau dashboard to explore the relationships and trends in uh, railroad employee injuries. Um, so I'll jump out of my PowerPoint slides in a little bit and give you a demo of that Tableau based tool. So um, what I'm going to be talking about during my presentation is, as I mentioned, some background stuff on the project itself. So I'll start with the motivation and objectives of the project, um, the framework that we, we, we developed um, that required some uh, trust building and stakeholder engagement to get railroad agencies to share their data with us, which was a, a challenge in itself. Um, we'll talk more about the data sharing and security, and then I'll get into a demo of the dashboard and then um, ne the next steps for this project. So with the motivation and objectives, um, you know, railroad safety, uh, both in terms of passenger um, and, and, and the people that work uh, for the railroads, um, we kind of plateaued. So we've made some, some good progress over the years, but the railroad employee uh, injury rate and the railroad accident rate have both kind of flatlined. Um, so this gave uh, FRA some insights that, you know, maybe uh, they could start to address this if they had more data. Um, they already make railroad agencies submit uh, on a regular basis uh, data, especially related to safety, uh, but they don't collect everything and, and agencies do their own thing and uh, usually don't share that, that data that they don't have to send out to other people. Um, they keep it in-house and you know, what we wanted to do was to model what uh, some of the other modes have done. Um, so there's a, a similar data sharing platform that was developed in the aviation community called ASIAS, which stands for the Aviation Safety Information Analysis and Sharing. And I think that program has been around for like 25 or 30 years. And they, they basically got the railroad, uh, or not the railroad, the airway um, airlines to share data about, you know, being delayed and early arrivals and, and different other safety related issues that are working behind the scenes that they typically don't have to share, not required to share with um, FAA. Then, uh, and more recently, there's the, the Partnership for Analytics Research and Traffic Safety, which is another data sharing program where the auto manufacturers started sharing some of their connected and automated vehicle data with each other so they can get you know, richer insights on those cutting edge technologies. So FRA want to kind of follow suit and do that in the rail industry. So, um, but before you do that, there's you know, some things you have to overcome in terms of getting stakeholders to trust you with uh, data that um, is very sensitive to them. So um, we first had to work. You know, they didn't really know who the cat, were, cat lab was when we first started the project. So we had to kind of prove to them that we knew what we were doing in terms of collecting and protecting data. Um, so we also had to develop this secure data capturing process so that they could share the data with us and be ensured that where we were storing it was uh, safe and secure. And then lastly, um, we worked with them to uh, figure out what some of their, their key challenges were from their perspective and how we could help them to analyze the data um, after they would send it to us. So without getting into too much detail about how RISE works, um, so it's funded by the FRA and they have um, subject matter experts at Volpe that work with them and they help me to you know, better understand rail data. As I mentioned, we we're somewhat new to that um, industry. Um, but we worked with them and we had five railroad companies that participated in the project, all uh, operating in the Northeast Corridor, the, you know, New York to um, you know, down to Washington, D.C. So there was five passenger railroads that volunteered to work uh, on this project and uh, they were ultimately the ones that, you know, picked the topics that we pursued and shared the data. So uh, we worked with them 
they would send us the data, we would anonymize it so that it couldn't be traced back to any one single stakeholder, and then develop this dashboard so that each individual participating railroad could benchmark their safety performance against the aggregate. So it was their, they would have access to their own data. For instance, everyone knows Amtrak, so I'll say Amtrak. Um, Amtrak would be able to see their results as well as the results of the, the aggregate results of the other participating railroad companies to see if they're you know, performing in a similar fashion. Before we could actually settle on a topic, we had to uh, come up with some research questions and then ask the stakeholders to share data with us so that we could assess, we created these, we, we called them internally, we called them data uh, capability ma matrices. So uh, you see there's five different stakeholders here and then different data items, and some had them, some didn't. Again, we were asking them to share data that they typically don't send outside of their agency. So there, most of this data was not uh, standardized or in a similar format. And we even found that in some cases, one railroad was collecting data on this particular item and the other ones are not. Um, so obviously if you do that, it's hard to anonymize the data. Um, if, if only one of the, for instance, if Amtrak was the only one collecting weather data, um, we couldn't include that in the final product because everybody would know that's uh, an observation from Amtrak. Um, we ultimately worked with them, um, and this was a, an iterative process of them defining some safety topics and research questions and then sharing some data with us so that we could assess if we had the data that we needed to address that question. Uh, we, we boiled it down to three topics that we were uh, initially considering to pursue is personal injuries, so the, the laborers, the people working um, uh, for in the labor unions for the railroads, um, act grade uh, crossing, so uh, where, where railways interact with uh, the road network. Um, obviously, when there's those types of crashes, they can be very severe. And then the last one is rules violations. So the operators of the trains and workers are you know, supposed to be following speed limits and stopping. If they have an eight-car train, there's a certain position they should stop at each station versus a 10-car train. So they keep track of that information um, as a sort of surrogate measure of safety. And again, they usually don't share any of that data um, outside of their agency. But they sent us the information, the data that they felt was related to that. And internally, my team at Cat Lab analyzed that, and we, we looked and ranked um, those three topics uh, as shown in the table here. So the availability of data to get deeper insights, um, how consistent the data was across the stakeholders, because if it isn't, we would have to come up with some normalization factors to, to kind of address that. Um, that's kind of related to the data cleaning and processing. Uh, the ability to anonymize the data, again, they, the agencies didn't want, Amtrak didn't want stakeholder to uh, MTA, let's call them, in, in New York City, to see uh, each other's data. So we had to anonymize that aggregate data set somehow. And then the last one is the ability to support deeper analysis. So again, um, when I talked about the motivation, we're kind of flatlined when it came to some of the safety statistics. So, and we already have all this data that we're sending to FRA, so what else can we learn from this data? So that was sort of the question and, and the analysis process that my team and I went through. So we ultimately decided to pursue uh, personal injuries. We did a little bit with rules violation, but um, some of the stakeholders were a little bit more standoffish about that, so there's less data that was in that, so I'll, I'll focus on the personal injury uh, tools that we developed. And then just real quickly, I want to talk about, um, you know, this was a, a significant amount of work for us to gain the trust of the stakeholders to share this sensitive data with us. Um, so we worked with them and gave them several options on how they could even just send us the data. Um, some were okay just packaging them up and sending them in an email if it was small enough. Other ones wanted an FTP server with a, a password protect. So uh, we accommodated that. Then once we had the data in hand, we worked in an encrypted environment where we stored the data and developed our analysis platforms. And once the final aggregate and anonymized data set was created, then we exported it out so that we could share the the, um, that data set as well as the Tableau dashboard with uh, the stakeholders. Um, the way that it works is we set up an online Tableau uh, tool. So you needed a, a user password and login that uh, we supported. And then once they went in, depending on their domain, so the FRA folks 
could only see the aggregate data set. They couldn't see any of the individual stakeholders that participated. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, all of the stakeholders had the ability to see their own data, so Amtrak could see their data and the aggregate so they can do the benchmarking. So I'm going to jump out of my PowerPoint um, and just pull up the Tableau dashboard that we developed. So there's several different um, tools that we ended up ultimately developing. Um, um, so just a heads up that this is Tableau reader version that I have on my laptop. It's not the full version, so, so the performance and, and, and responsiveness is a little bit slower than it usually is. But uh, I, I think I'll be able to work through it. So this is um, the Personal Injury Explorer dashboard. So um, right now we're looking at um, all of the data. And if, if, if I was a stakeholder, I could see an individual stakeholder's uh, view. And you'll see that kind of update. And the number of observations will be less. But uh, go back to all. So again, this is the aggregate data set. So this dashboard is fully interactive. So there's several different variables that we got related to personal injuries. Right now it's showing the distribution of um, the nature of the injury. So you can see if it's a sprain uh, or strain, a bruise or con contusion, so forth, all the way down the list. Um, so the key thing here is um, if the injuries are above a certain severity level, they're required to report that to the FRA. So the FRA already has that information. But then there's these other injuries that are less severe um, that they don't have to, they have to uh, document it, but don't necessarily have to send it to FRA. And that, those were the, the variables that we were asking them to share with us. So we use the combination of what they already send to FRA, and that's the blue bars that you're seeing, the reportable injuries. And then the non-reportable injuries are the additional new information. And just taking a quick glance at you know, the, the percentage, like by adding in the non-reportable injuries, we almost increased the data set by 50%, right? So it was a lot of new data that we got just by including these, these non-severe um, uh, injuries. And what you can do is look at the data in several different ways. You can stack the reportable and non-reportable together. So you can see, you know, it, in the worst case, what if those non-reportables were actually a little bit more severe? How bad could it be, right? So a stack bar chart meets that need. Um, you can also do um, side by side. So rather than stacking them together, um, you have one, uh, two bars for each of the, in this case, the nature of injury. So you can see, is that trend that we're seeing, in this case for the aggregate, aggregate data set, is the trend in reportables the same as it is in non-reportables, right? So those are the type of questions you can start asking. Um, lots of different variables that we have, so we can change it by um, hour of day, during day or weekend, um, years of service, um, the location of the incident, what the weather conditions were. I can switch it to severity so you can just see what that looks like. Um, you can see, um, you know, the, the nature of the injury and, and, and how severe it was. Um, one other thing that railroads were really interested in when it comes to, like, um, employee safety is the number of lost days. Uh, that gets back to their insurance rates, all those other good things about um, you know, providing uh, those types of services for your employees. So we also included some um, additional information about the number of lost days uh, from these types of injuries. Now say you wanted to focus on one particular type um, of injury. Let's say you wanted uh, the minor injuries that were non-reportable. You can click on that bar and it dynamically filters and updates all the charts below it. So we de designed it like that, obviously, um, to, to do that. But having a tool that does start with the overall distribution of the data, find something that's interesting in it, and then click and, and, and filter down. So you can do it all sort of on the same interface. You don't have to do a query page, recognize that you don't have the right dates or something, go back and rerun your query. You can easily you know, step out of this saying, I don't want that anymore. I'm going to hit the reset button, and it's going to take me back to um, the full view.
So this right now, th this dashboard that we're looking at is sort of the raw um, frequencies that we look at. Um, now some of the data or the uh, railroads also provided um, some information about the hours that were worked by the employees. So this is similar, a, nor a nor normalization factor that we use in you know, labor safety. It's equivalent to what we do in traffic if you did something like the vehicle miles traveled, right? What's the exposure of the people that are getting injured? And we use that. So we, we kind of extrapolated on some of the labor data that we have to come up with normalized results for these injuries saying, how many reportable injuries are there per, you know, 10,000 employee hours worked? And that gets back to what we heard in the, 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 the keynote session with the gentleman from the Washington Post that talked about normalization, right? So the reason why it's important in this project is because the number of observations that we're getting from Amtrak are going to greatly outnumber the ones that we get from you know, the, the Philadelphia, uh, what they call SEPTA, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transit Administration. Um, so we had to normalize that so that we can do the, the comparisons between the two. Um, so some of the variables that we got were continuous variables, other ones were categorical or uh, discretized variables. So we came up with this dashboard to kind of explore the relationships between different variables. Um, so on the left here you're seeing this bubble chart that's right now it's showing the years of service versus last days. Um, you might expect that people that have longer years of service might be older and more susceptible to more days off because they might not be able to recover as quickly from their injuries as a younger person. So you can explore those types of relationships and you can change these variables. If you don't want to do um, years of service, you can do it by you know, the, the, the person's age um, and it kind of updates the chart accordingly. Uh, the colors are for the different injury types. The, the size of the dots are um, showing the average number of lost days for that particular injury type. Uh, relative to the age of the person. It's kind of a, a three-dimensional plot on a, on a two-dimensional chart. Um, we also look at, um, there's a scatter plot here that's showing, uh, you can look at the, the, the two-factor relationship between age and lost days to see if there's any correlations going on there. And then we also have a box and whisker that breaks down um, you know, the, the, the descriptive statistics for each of the categories, in this case for um, the nature of the injury um, by the lost days is to see if there's any ones that stick out or if there's outliers in a particular one that's uh, influencing the results that you get. So another dashboard that we developed um, is this multivariate personal injury uh, dashboard. So again, you can explore and, and create uh, different types of charts. Um, if you want to filter by days of the week, if you just want to do Wednesdays, for instance, you can do that. It'll take a minute, but it'll update the results here, and you can see everything kind of shifting around. Uh, all the same variables that you had in the previous dashboard are still here. So if you want to go to number of injuries, um, we can use that to create the, the y-axis and then you know, we can pick these different dimensions. Uh, right now, nature of injury by craft, or we could do it by uh, event circumstances. Um, so it's, it's fully dynamic, um, updates based on uh, the filters that you've applied. After you start applying, in this case, I did uh, filtering by Wednesdays, you can see the number of observations uh, went down. 
to 314, so you're only getting a subset of that. You can also do it by hour of day um, or by the month in, in which it occurred. This next dashboard, my team and I thought were, was pretty basic, but this the one that FRA got most excited about. Um, so they asked us to do the, what they call a risk matrix. So again, it gets back to helping the railroad agencies understand the relationship between you know, injuries themselves and lost days as well as the cost of injuries. So we created these plots uh, that, that are linked together. So um, on the left side, it's showing the average uh, lost days versus um, the number of injuries. Um, you can also change this one as you, as you did before. If you wanna go by injured body region, it'll update uh, the dots accordingly. And you can see the legend down here. So if you're interested in, let, let's focus on um, torso injuries. So if I wanna come in and, and look at uh, that one and just kind of fo focus in on it, I can get um, hover over and get some more metadata and I can click that, it'll filter on both of the charts so you can kind of just focus in on that one point and um, get more information about that particular, in this case, it's about the, uh, the torso uh, area type injuries. Oh, I forgot to show in this um, multivariate personal injury. So this isn't one bar chart, but we also have several other um, charts that, that can be used to display the relationships between variables. So I'm going to switch to this um, Sankey diagram. It usually takes a minute for it to load. So, you know, the Sankey diagram allows you to look at the relationships between different variables and you know the, the color is related to the category that's on the left and then the thickness is uh, a stronger relationship between those variables. So it kind of looks like a big spaghetti bowl but it's really developed to help um, the user look at the variable values, in this case it's categorical variables that we're looking at uh, in the relationship between them. And again with the other tools um, you can look at you know, changing this to um, do hour of day, bin, and we'll update that um, on the right side. You see that get updated, and then the new chords going to them, which are again representative of the correlation between those variables, kind of update dynamically. So that, that, that's the dashboard on personal injuries. We did something similar with uh, the rules violation, but uh, you know, kind of less data there and, and more, more of the same stuff. So I won't show that one. I'll conclude here with uh, next steps for this project. So I mentioned this is, we're in part two of a multi-phase project. So we're working on getting new stakeholders, additional stakeholders engaged, including those from freight rail. Uh, to pick some new topics and pursue uh, additional safety topics with a, with a larger team. Um, that's underway, we haven't picked the topic yet, but in the meantime, we have a, another task spin out of this where we created an online data collection form for enforcement agencies, because the FRA gives grants to enforcement agencies to pay police off-duty police officers to patrol railroad property to, uh, make observations on trespassing. Um, one thing I learned when I got into the rail research is quite a high number of suicides happen on railroad property. People jumping off bridges or jumping in front of trains, uh, type of things going on. So the first step to trying to mitigate that, or not the first step, obviously they're, they're trying to do more, but understanding who are these people that are on the tracks. So they paid or they had a grant um, submission session and 25 agencies were awarded and we're working with them now so that when their officers go out on patrol they can document um, some information about the people that they're observing who are trespassing. So it's an online form, they can submit it and once it's approved by the enforcement agency supervisor, it gets sent to FRA. Before we started doing this for them, they had the agencies filling out an Excel form by hand <laughs> on their own, which you know there's issues with that. Um, and sending it to FRA each quarter. 
So this is a, a huge step for them to, be, to automate that process to get data in almost real time once it's entered into the system. So that concludes my project. I, I appreciate your time and attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fair question. So this is actually more of a labor safety than it is a transportation safety. So these injuries are occurring to employees of the railroad company uh, that might be fixing a piece of equipment in the rail yard. They could be loading or unloading a passenger's luggage for them. Uh, so it's not necessarily related to any crash. Now there are crash events that injure railroad employees, so we have some of those observations, but most of them are from them just doing their day-to-day -day job. And yeah, yeah. Which is why we were able to collect that level of the, the, the variables that you saw, because yeah, that, that's an internal system that they do the reporting on. So we only had three of the stakeholders provide that critical part of like the hours worked. So you need that to normalize to get the rate. But what we found, it, it, it's like less than one in 10, 10 to the fourth, is, they use some weird units at FRA, to the fourth employee hours worked is when they see, um, I think it's major injuries. The minor ones is a slightly different rate. It's a little bit higher than that. Is there another question or? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess when did this start? I mean, you, you, you think Pablo, but if you had a chance, would you have done a power platform type of? Yeah. So this started. I think the project officially started in 2018. We finished phase one in 2020, and now we're in phase two. Um, I'm not as familiar with, with other you know, dashboard creating. A cat lab, we oftentimes will build our own custom software. Um, but because this is a relatively small data set, at least for, for cat lab it was, um, we wanted to keep the cost down, so we decided to do it in Tableau. Um, moving forward, we might use other out-of-the-box software or develop something custom online. But it kind of depends on things like data size and, and, and different parameters that we can do. Um, Evaluate. Yeah. Is the aggregate data available to the general public? It is not, unfortunately. Um, it's part of our, we had to come up with like a, a charter and rough, you know, memorandum of understanding that we wouldn't share the data, uh, even aggregate outside of the group. Now, that being said, um, I could ask for permission if you're using it uh, for research purposes and see if I can get that to you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Anything else? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, this presentation is about the multi-resolution transportation network representation. Uh, why we want to do the multi-resolution modeling in traffic analysis? For many, many reasons. Uh, three years ago, after I arrived at the Arizona State, Arizona State University have uh, two teams. 
One is our team's mainly focused on dynamic traffic assignment, and another team, uh, which is led by uh, Professor Ram Pandiyala, they do a lot of job about uh, activity-based model. So they are uh, demand-side model and uh, our supply-side model, and uh, we, we think um, our leader, uh, Professor Su Sum Zhou, uh, we say, oh, there's a good chance we can integrate with each other, right? These two models, but we find that there are a lot of challenges if we want to integrate these two models. And uh, one solution, after we discussed many times, to solve this problem is we must have a common or general network representation for multi-resolution networks. So our team, our team led by Dr. Su Sum Zhou, we already do a lot of work about it. Uh, we develop uh, a lot of currently still independent packages, and all of them are open source, and we upload them online everyone can download them and use them. But all of these independent packages are following one same network representation, which is GMNS, General Modeling Network Specification. And we'll try to use this network no matter, uh, no matter you are demand side model or you are supply, uh, supply side model, you can follow a same network representation, you, no matter you are macroscopic model, mesoscopic model, or microscopic model, you follow the same network representation, and then in the, in the future, maybe in the near future, we can integrate all of them together and generate a, a whole model which can run together. Uh, so let me briefly introduce all these packages. The first one is uh, OSM to GMNS, which means the OpenStreetMap to GMNS. Uh, what, uh, what this package do uh, if you want to cut a subnetwork from the OpenStreetMap? website, and then we can convert it directly, automatically, just to use a few Python lines. You can convert it from the OpenStreetMap shapefile to the uh, network following the GMNS data format. And uh, it can also automatically uh, generate the corresponding macroscopic network, mesoscopic network, and uh, microscopic network. So all of them can generate automatically. This is the first package. And uh, when sometimes our, we do not have uh, uh, available traffic analysis zones data, so the second package can help us to generate the grid-like TAZs, traffic analysis zones, and uh, uh, estimate the demands for us using the gravity model. And the third one is a passport GMNS, which means if you have a GMNS network, then we can do the hash uh, searching, we can do the routing, and do the static traffic assignment, uh, dynamic traffic assignment on the network, just to use few Python lines. And the third one is a map matching for GMIS, because our team and also the team now I'm working with co uh, co collaborated with the Cat Lab. So y sometimes we can download the RATIS data. But sometimes we do not know how the, re the relationship between the RATIS data and the OpenStreetMap data. So we also have a tool developed for map matching, just to map the uh, RATIS data and also other trajectory data onto the network, on the GMNS network. So this is a map matching tool. And uh, the third one, after we map match all the data on the network, we also have a package to do the calibration to calibrate the macroscopic uh, fundamental diagrams, include the density, compacity, and uh, also uh, the free flow speed, and also other important parameters in traffic flow models automatically. And also, we can calibrate the Q spillback and uh, also other parameters uh, used to, to generate the, uh, the traffic dynamics uh, on some bottlenecks. So th that, uh, that is the function of that package. And then we have uh, two, I think, uh, not two major packages related to the CG, computational graph, uh, which is we use some technologies based on, uh, from TensorFlow, which is from Google, and uh, then this is also an open source machine learning library, and we use that library to do a lot of uh, traffic state estimation 
and also the calibrate the traffic behaviors models. And the last one is that we also calibrate, uh, convert the GTFS, uh, which is uh, uh, for the public transit, and we can also convert that data format to the GMS network. So in the future, maybe we can integrate the uh, traffic network with the transit network together, use the same data format. So this is all the packages developed by our uh, team. We do not, currently we do not integrate them together. But uh, the same thing is that all these packages are following the same data format, format which is a GMNS. Okay, so uh, here I think I do, do not want to talk too much about the motivation, why we need to have a common uh, multi-resolution uh, network representation. Uh, uh, from the network perspective, uh, we have different net, n uh, network, right? We have a macroscopic network for the traffic demand modeling. And uh, sometimes if we want to do the signal control or signal plan, we need a macroscopic network. And if you want to consider the lane changes and the interactions between the different ve vehicles, we need the microscopic network. So according to the strategies we consider, we use different networks. For example, sometimes if we consider events or uh, uh, incident, sometimes in incident just impact a shooter. Sometimes it will impact several lanes, and sometimes it will impact the whole corridor. So uh, no matter what work zones, what incident we consider, um, it will impact on different network if we, we want to model them, right? So this is the reason why we need to matter multi-resolution network. And uh, also the demand side, after we discuss with uh, another team in the uh, Arizona State, they also find a lot of uh, problem because uh, if we consider demand, demand sometimes it has a potential demand which is unobservable. And another is a uh, accomplished demand which is what we can observe, right? For example, we can observe on a corridor which have a very restricted capacity. So they want to know how the restriction of the capacity can impact the demand, right? For example, if the capacity on quarter is very low, then usually do not have too much demand, but how we can measure it, right? So uh, uh, after we discuss with them, they found that, oh, the different description of the network or the facility will impact the results in the model of the estimation of the demand, which means if you consider the capacity of the corridor, then you will have a macroscopic demand. But if you will consider just a lane, then you will have a microscopic demand. So it's quite different. So this is the reason why the demand side model and the supply side model are interconnected or connected with each other, right? Mm. So uh, in order to uh, integrate these two, uh, two different models, ABM model and DTA model, this is the reason why we need to do it. So this is our solution, is multi-resolution modeling. And uh, we also wrote a guidebook, uh, that link, uh, the guidebook about this methodology. If anyone interested, you can see the guidebook on that. Okay, so uh, what is the matter resolution model? This is a simple example. We follow the GMNS, just I, like I, uh, I said. The first one is a macroscopic network. And the, center, uh, the, the figure in the center is a macroscopic network. And the right side is a microscopic network. So you find the, the first one, the first network is a, is a network we usually use in our tra traffic demand modeling. And the second one, we consider a lot of turning links to, uh, if we want to describe some of the signal, plan, uh, signal control or signal planning. And the third one, we find that uh, there were a lot of links for, to describe the lane control and the vehicle fo uh, car following and also other behavior. So these are three networks. If you use download this open street, uh, open street map to GMNS, you download the OpenStreetMap, uh, th this package, and uh, you cut a sub-network 
from the OpenStreetMap website, then our package will help you generate these three networks automatically. Okay, the, the first one is the microscopic, and the meso and the micro, all of them can generate it automatically. So this is example, we cut a, 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 cut a sub area in the Washington DC metropolitan area, and then the right side is GMNS network. They, they have a, both a macro, a macro network, meso network, and a micro network. And uh, because uh, there are a lot of information in the uh, OpenStreetMap, okay, so uh, it also can describe different resolution or di different fidelity network. Uh, the first one is the driver network, and uh, you can also consider the bikeable network or the workable network. It depends on your purpose. And uh, most interesting, we can also get a lot of uh, point of interest from the OpenStreetMap. Uh, that's very useful because in the future we can use them to generate the demand. Uh, this is a, a case study we did in the Phoenix metropolitan area, and the right side most is the uh, uh, macroscopic network, and then we convert it to the macroscopic network. But in this, the focused area we are interested, we use microscopic network. And there are a lot of uh, bridge links to uh, to combine the uh, microscopic network and the mesoscopic network, just like this, and uh, integrate them into a, merge them into a, a, a whole network. Okay, so uh, the first is, uh, in this network we have the uh, macro one, meso one, and micro one, and we generate the bridge links between different, link, uh, dif different networks and merge them into one layer. Uh, this this work relates to the transit network. Uh, we also model the access, uh, egress links, uh, board and deboard links, the service links, and transfer links from all of them. And this is a case study we did in metropolitan area of the Washington D.C. Um, <coughs> uh, all the data is from we download them from the company's uh, website, and they have their GTFS data. And then we convert that uh, GTF data to the GMNS data and do the traffic transit assignment on the uh, service network. Uh, and uh, the result is here. This is a boarding at different stations. Okay, so we also de uh, developed some CBI2. CBI2 is uh, uh, try to use to identify the uh, content duration, uh, intensity, uh, variety and also queue length of the different bottlenecks. Uh, if uh, after you, for example, we use the uh, Redis data or, or use us data, after we can download them, we can capture the uh, congestion pattern of them and then calibrate some key parameters for the uh, queuing process and then we can duplicate them. Okay. Uh, so, but before we do it, we must do map matching just like uh, I said. Here is a, a case study we do in the area of Northern, Northern, uh, uh, Northern Virginia. And uh, all the data we download, I'm sorry, download from the cat lab <laughs> rated data, and then we map them onto the OpenStreetMap data. And then these two data are combined with, it, which, uh, uh, with each other. And then we use our CBI2 to calibrate the parameters for uh, for queuing and uh, for the dynamic traffic assignment. Uh, so this is the result, one of the results of our uh, dynamic traffic assignment result. Uh, it can, sh you can see here, it can show the microscopic network in the focused area. Uh, and also, we find that there are some links, it, it's just approximation, it's not uh, follow the, uh, Google map, right? And uh, also we, we can find the queuing, we can uh, see the plane tunes, uh, trucks and the vehicles and uh, how the traffic light will impact the traffic flow. Uh, and here we find that we can also simulate all the details on the ramps uh, and also on the critical corridors and also on the intersections. 
Okay, so the last place is the uh, demand model, how we can integrate with other team. Uh, so uh, what we want to do, this is not accomplished. We only published some paper, but uh, n n not, not, we do not have any product on it. Okay, so uh, we do not have any product on it. Uh, what we want to do is uh, we want to create a hierarchical uh, structure. The first layer is uh, the zone, the second layer is the different destination, and the third layer is uh, the path between the uh, origin and destination, and then different paths will combine on each, each link. And then we can uh, map different kinds of the data sources to the different layers of, of the network. And uh, also we can use uh, uh, POI uh, data we downloaded from OpenStreetMap to do the calibration and uh, try to in the future can integrate with the ABM model. But this is what we just uh, start to do. It's very hard, right? So currently we only still only have some independent packages. But uh, in the future, I think the ASU team will try to integrate them all together. Okay, thank you. So uh, I, uh, here is just a, a, a short summary. Um, why we need, uh, want to integrate, uh, you know, we, we have the solution of the machine resolution uh, modeling. The first is that I think we want re, uh, our model to can reflect the microscopic flow model, and uh, secondly, it can represent the bottleneck cooling uh, phenomenon, and also it can have a consistent cross-resolution uh, definition, include the microscopic, mesoscopic and microscopic. And in the future, because we can map uh, other data onto the network, so it can, in the future, it has a potential to develop the data-driven approach. Uh, that's uh, all for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, and this, uh, this presentation is prepared by my colleagues, uh, Mohammed. I just, I, I acknowledge this is her, his contribution. Uh, but uh, the works are, uh, we work together, and uh, our whole team work for it. Thank you. Thank you. But it depends on, uh, it still needs the traffic demand model. So we uh, co uh, collaborated with uh, some agencies after they gave us uh, the demand and their network. And I, we compare our results with their, because they have a very mature results. They use it many years and compare the results. It's very close in the macroscopic levels but uh, in the mesoscopic uh, levels and uh, microscopic levels, because sometimes even the agency do not have the data, right? So well, what we want to do is that our mesoscopic results and uh, microscopic results, after they aggregate, it should be consistent with the macroscopic result. This is a basic requirement. Uh, actually, uh, I'm not sure whether, whether this judgment is uh, correct or not. In most uh, applications, for example, you run a DTA model and uh, you run a static traffic assignment model, sometimes they do not have consistent results, right? If you aggregate the uh, dynamic traffic assignment model results and uh, to compare it with the static traffic assignment, I think this is the reason why most of the agencies do not want to use DTA because they believe, they, 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 they trust uh, static traffic assignment model, they used many, many years, but they do not want to use uh, your uh, advanced DTA model because if you cannot uh, uh, guarantee they are consistent with each other, how, how I can use it? So I think this is the reason why we want to do this work. But uh, the basic re requirement for us is that no matter uh, what the results are, in your mesoscopic model or your microscopic model, model, after you aggregate them, it should be consistent with the macroscopic network. 
uh, macroscopic demand model. So this is uh, our, um, this is pretty quite right. And uh, yes, actually, uh, uh, from the perspective of academic, I think there are still a lot of puzzles here. For example, how, uh, for example, a strategy, for example, a macroscopic strategy or microscopic uh, strategy or transport policy, how it will impact the demand. It's very hard to calculate the shadow price in, in economics, the, the, different, the marginal effect of it. For example, if I expand a lane, add one more lane on a corridor, what will, how it will impact the demand? It's very hard to calculate the um, marginal effect of it. Yeah, it depends on the, uh, the research here. We, we, we try to do a lot of uh, research about it to integrate the demand side and the supply side, but there's still a lot of puzzles here. Thank you. Any Thank other, you. Any other questions? All right. So let's keep track. We have 30 minutes. We want to open mic. Anybody else have any other discussion? Maybe 